Ender's Game by Orson Scott Card. Chapter 1. Third. I've watched through his eyes. I've listened through his ears. And I tell you, he's the one. Or at least as close as we're going to get. And that's what you said about the brother. The brother tested out impossible for other reasons. Nothing to do with his ability. Same with the sister. And there are doubts about him. He's too malleable. Too willing to submerge himself in someone else's will. Not if the other person is his enemy. So what do we do? Surround him with enemies all the time? If we have to. I thought you said you liked this kid. If the buggers get him, they'll make him... They'll make me look like his favorite uncle. All right, we're saving the world after all. Take him. The monitor lady smiled very nicely and tousled, tussled his hair <laughs> and said, Andrew, I suppose by now you're just absolutely sick of having that horrid monitor. Well, I've got good news for you. That monitor is going to come out today. We're going to take it out. We're going to take it right out, and it won't hurt a bit. Ender nodded. It was a lie, of course, uh, that it wasn't going to hurt a bit. But since adults always said that it was going to hurt, uh, he could count on that statement as an accurate prediction of the future. Sometimes lies were more dependable than the truth. So if you'll just come over here, Andrew, just sit right up here on the examining table. The doctor will be in to see you in a, mo in a moment. The monitor gone. Ender tried to imagine the little device missing from the back of his neck. I'll roll over on my back in bed, and it won't be pressing there. I won't feel it tingling and taking up the heat when I shower. And Peter won't hate me anymore. I'll come home and show him that the monitor's gone. He'll see that I didn't make it either. That I'll be just a normal kid now, like him. That won't be so bad. Then he'll forgive me that I had my monitor a whole year longer than he had his. We'll be... Not friends, probably, no. Peter was too dangerous. Peter got so angry. Brothers, though. Not enemies, not friends, but brothers. Able to, li to live in the same house. He won't hate me. He'll just leave me alone. And when he wants to play buggers and astronauts, maybe I won't have to play. Maybe I could just go read a book. But Ender knew, even as he thought it, that Peter wouldn't leave him alone. There was something in Peter's eyes. When he was in his mad mood, whenever Ender saw that look, that glint, he knew, though. The one thing Peter would not do was leave him alone. I'm practicing piano, Ender. Come turn the pages for me. Oh, is that a monitor boy too busy to help his brother? Is he too smart? Gotta go kill some buggers, astronaut? No, 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 I don't want your help. I can do it on my own, you little bastard, you little third. This won't take long, Andrew, said the doctor. Ender nodded. It's designed to be re removed. Without infection, without damage, but there'll be some tickling, and some people say they have a feeling of something missing. You'll keep looking around for something, something you were looking for, but you can't find it and you can't remember what it was. So I'll tell you, it's the monitor you're looking for and it isn't there. In a few days, that feeling will pass. The doctor was twisting something at the back of Ender's head. Suddenly a pain stabbed through him like a needle from his groin to his, from his neck to his groin. Ender felt his back spasm and his body arched violently backward. His head struck the bed. He could feel his head, legs thrashing and his hands were clenching each other, wringing each other so tightly in the arch. Dee Dee shouted the doctor, I need you. The nurse ran in, gasped, got to relax these muscles. Get it to me now. What are you waiting for? Something changed hands. Ender could not see. He lurched to one side and fell off the examining table. Catch him, cried the nurse. Just hold him steady. You hold him, doctor. He's too strong for me. Not the whole thing. You'll stop his heart. Ender felt a needle enter his back just above the neck of his shirt it burned but whenever in him the fire spread his muscles gradually unclenched now he could cry for the fear and pain of it are you all right ender or are you all right andrew the nurse asked andrew could not remember how to speak they lifted him onto the table they checked his pulse did other things he didn't understand at all the doctor was trembling his voice shook as he spoke they leave these things in the kids for three years what do they expect we could have switched him off. Do you realize that? We could have unplugged his brain for all, all time. When does the drug wear off? Asked the nurse. Keep him here for at least an hour. Watch him. If he doesn't start talking in 15 minutes, call me. Could have unplugged him forever. I don't have the brains of a bugger. He got back to Mrs. Pumphrey's class only 15 minutes before the closing bell. He was still a little unsteady at his feet. Are you all right, Andrew? Asked Mrs. Pumphrey. He nodded. Were you ill? He shook his head. You don't look well. I'm okay. You better sit down, Andrew. He started toward his seat, but stopped. 
Now, what was I looking for? I can't think. What was I looking for? Your seat is over there, said Miss Pumphrey. He sat down, but it was something else he needed, something else he had lost. I'll find it later. Your monitor, whispered the girl behind him. Andrew shrugged. His monitor, she whispered to the others. Andrew reached up and felt his neck. There was a band-aid. It was gone. He was just like everybody else now. Washed out, Andy? Asked the boy who sat across the aisle behind him. Couldn't think of his name. Peter? No, that was someone else. Quiet, Mr. Stilson, said Mrs. Pumphrey. Stilson smirked. Stilson. Mrs. Pumphrey talked about multiplication. Ender doodled on his desk, drawing contour maps of mountainous islands and telling his desk to display them in three dimensions from every angle. The teacher would know, of course, that he wasn't paying attention. Uh, but she wouldn't bother him. He always knew the answer whenever she thought he wasn't paying attention. In the corner of his desk, a word appeared and began marching around the perimeter of the desk. It was upside down and backward at first, uh, but Ender knew what it said long before it reached the bottom of the desk and turned right side up. Third, Ender smiled. He was the one who had figured out how to send messages and make them march. Even as his secret enemy called him names, the method of delivery praised him. It was not his fault he was a third. It was the government's idea. They were the ones who authorized it. How else could a third like Ender have got into school? And now the monitor was gone. The experiment entitled in Andrew Wigan hadn't worked out after all. If they could, he was sure that they would like to rescind the waivers that had allowed him to be born at all. It didn't work, so he erased the experiment. The bell rang. Everyone signed off their desk or hurriedly typed in remainder, reminders to themselves. Some were dumping lessons or data into their computers at home. A few gathered at the printers while something they wanted to show was printed out. Ender spread his hands over the child size keyboard near the edge of the desk and wondered what it would feel like to have the hands as large as a grown-up's. They must feel so big and awkward. Thick, stubby fingers and beef, beefy palms. Of course they had bigger keyboards. But how could they? their thick fingers draw a fine line? The way Ender could, a thin line so precise that he could make it spiral 79 times from the center of the edge of the desk without the lines ever touching or overlapping. It gave him something to do while the teacher droned on about arithmetic. Arithmetic. Valentine had taught him arithmetic when he was three. Are you all right, Andrew? Yes, ma'am. You'll miss the bus. Ender nodded and got up. The other kids were gone. They would be waiting, though, the bad ones. His monitor wasn't perched on his neck. Hearing what he heard and seeing what he saw, they could say what they liked. They might even hit him now. No one could see them anymore, and so no one would come to Ender's rescue. There were advantages to the monitor, and he had missed them. It was Stilson, of course. Fucking Stilson. <laughs> He wasn't bigger than most of the other kids, but he's bigger than Ender, and he had some others with him. He always did. Hey, third. Don't answer. Nothing to say. Hey, third. We're talking to you. Third. Hey, bugger lover. We're talking to you. Can't think of anything to answer. Anything I say will make it worse, so we'll say nothing. Hey, third. Hey, turd. You flunked out, huh? Thought you were better than us, but you lost your little birdie, thirdy. Got a band-aid on your neck. Are you going to let me through, Ender asked. Are we going to let him through? Should we let him through? They all laughed. Sure, we'll let you through. First, we'll let your arm through, then your butt through, then maybe a piece of your knee. The others chimed in. Lost your birdie, 30. Lost your birdie, 30. Stilson began pushing him with one hand. Someone behind him then pushed him towards Stilson. Seesaw Major Marjorie Dahl. Seesaw Marjorie Dahl. Someone said, tennis, ping pong. This would not have a happy ending, so Ender decided that he'd rather not be the unhappiest at the end. The next time Stilson's arm came out to push him, Ender grabbed at it, and he missed. Oh, you're going to fight me, huh? going to fight me, 30. The people behind Ender grabbed at him to hold him. Ender did not feel like laughing, but he laughed. You mean it takes this many of you to fight one-third? We're people, not thirds, turd face. You're about as strong as a fart. But they let go of him, and as soon as they did, Ender kicked out high and hard, catching Stilson square in the breastbone. He dropped. It took Ender by surprise. He had thought to put Stilson on the ground with one kick. It didn't occur to him that Stilson didn't take a fight like this serious, that he wasn't prepared for a truly desperate blow. For a moment, the others backed away, and Stilson lay motionless. They are all wondering if he was dead. Ender, however, was trying to figure out a way to forestall vengeance, to keep them from taking him in a pack tomorrow. I have to win this now and for all time, or I'll fight it every day, and it will get worse and worse. 
Ender knew the unspoken rules of manly warfare. Even though he was only six, it was forbidden to strike the opponent who lay helpless on the ground. Only an animal would do that. So Ender walked to Stilson's supine body and kicked him again, viciously in the ribs. Stilson groaned and rolled away from him. Ender walked around him and kicked him again in the crotch. Stilson could not make a sound. He only doubled up and tears streamed out of his eyes. Then Ender looked at the others coldly. You might be having some idea of ganging up on me. You could probably beat me up pretty bad, but just remember what I do to people who try to hurt me. From then on, you'll be wondering when I'd get you and how bad it would be. He kicked Stilson in the face. Blood from his nose splattered the ground nearby. It wouldn't be this bad, Ender said. It would be worse. He turned and walked away. Nobody followed him. He turned a, cor a corner into the corridor leading to the bus stop. He could hear the boys behind him saying, Geez, look at him. He's wasted. Ender leaned his head against the wall of the corridor and cried until the bus came. I'm just like Peter. Take my monitor away. And I'm just like Peter. Chapter 2. Peter. All right, it's off. How's he doing? You live inside somebody's body for a few years, you get used to it. I look at his face now. I can't tell what's going on. I'm not used to seeing his facial expressions. I'm used to feeling them. Come on. We're not talking about psychoanalysis here. We're soldiers, not witch doctors. You just saw him beat the guts out of the leader of a gang. He was thorough. He didn't just beat him. He beat him deep. Like Mazer Rackham. Like Mazer Rackham at the spare me. So in the judgment of the committee, he passes. Mostly, let's see what he does with his brother, now that the monitor's off. His brother? Aren't you afraid of what his brother will do to him? You were the one who told me that this, was, this wasn't this was a no-risk business. I went back through some of the tapes. I can't help it. I like the kid. I think we're going to screw him up. Of course we are. It's our job. We're the wicked witch. We promised gingerbread, but we eat the little bastards alive. I'm sorry, Ender, Valentine whispered. She was looking at the band-aid on his neck. Ender touched the wall and the door closed behind him. I don't care. I'm glad it's gone. What's gone? Peter walked into the parlor, chewing on a mouthful of bread and peanut butter. Ender not, did not see Peter as the beautiful 10-year-old boy that growing up saw, with dark, thick, tussled hair and a face that could have belonged to Alexander the Great. Ender looked at Peter only to detect anger or boredom, the dangerous moods that always led to pain. Now as Peter's eyes discovered the band-aid on his neck, the Tell tale flicker of anger appeared. Valentine saw it too. Now he's like us, she said, trying to soothe him before he had time to strike. But Peter would not be soothed. Like us? He keeps a little sucker till he's six years old. When did you lose yours? You were three. I lost mine when I, before I was five. He almost made it, little bastard, little bugger. This is all right in her thought. Talk and talk, Peter. Talk is fine. Well, now your guardian angels aren't watching over you, Peter said. Now they aren't checking to see if you feel pain listening to hear what I'm saying, seeing what I'm doing to you. How about that? How about it? Ender shrugged. Suddenly, Peter smiled and clapped his hands together in a mockery of good cheer. Let's play buggers and astronauts, he said. Where's Mom? asked Valentine. Out, said Peter. I'm in charge. I think I'll call Daddy. Call away, said Peter. You know he's never in. I'll play, Ender said. You be the bugger, said Peter. Let him be the astronaut for once, Valentine said. Keep your fat face out of it, fart mouth, said Peter. Come on upstairs and choose your weapons. It would not be a good game, Ender knew. It was not a question of winning. When kids played in the corridors, hold troops of them, the buggers never won. And sometimes the games got mean, but here in their flat, the game would start mean, and the bugger couldn't just go empty and quit the way buggers did in the real wars. The bugger was in it until the astronaut decided it was over. So torture. Peter opened his bottom drawer and took out the bugger mask. Mom had got upset at him when Peter bought it, but Dad pointed out that the war wouldn't just uh, go away just because you hid bugger mask and went and let your kid play with make-believe laser guns. Better to play the war games and have a better chance of surviving when the buggers came again. If I survive the games, thought Ender, he put on the mask. If I survive the games, thought Ender. He put on the mask and closed him in like a hand pressed tight against his face. But this isn't how it feels to be a bugger, thought Ender. They don't wear this face like a mask. It is their face. On their home worlds, do the buggers put on human mask and play? And what do they call us? Slimies because we're soft and oily compared to them? 
Watch out, slimy, and Ender said. <laughs> so, Ender's Game, page 11. Check it out. My favorite book of all time. 